Peter W. Singer is one of the world's leading authorities on modern warfare. He's a senior fellow and director of the 21st Century Defense Initiative at the Brookings Institution. And in fact, he is, uh, according to the, uh, the institution's website, the youngest senior fellow ever in the history of this 90-year-old institution. He has consulted for the Pentagon and the CIA and served as coordinator of Barack Obama's Defense Policy Task Force during the campaign. He has lectured before Congress and more than 40 universities around the world. He has been cited in countless print publications and broadcast media, including CNN, BBC, CBS, The Daily Show, and the extremely popular internet site, Blogging Heads TV. Peter's first two books were Corporate Warriors and Children at War, which explored the growing roles of mercenaries and child warriors in wars around the world. Today, he's going to talk about his new book, Wired for War, The Robotics Revolution and Conflict in the 21st Century, which was a New York Times bestseller. John Stewart of The Daily Show called this book awesome, and I agree. <laughs> Wired for War is not only an amazing piece of reporting, on an extremely important topic. It's also a terrific read, and I thank God that more scholars can't write as well as Peter Singer. We have copies of the book for sale right here, and Peter would be happy to sign them at the end of his talk. So please give Peter Singer a warm welcome to Stevens. kind welcome and all of you for coming out, particularly those of you who are not getting extra credit. I appreciate it extra much. Um, what I'd like to do is actually start with the opening scene of the book. And for this you have to imagine yourself in a rock. And ahead of you is what looks like a piece of trash alongside the road. But that insurgent has hidden that IED, that improvised explosive device, that roadside bomb with great care. Now by 2006, there were more than 2,500 of these roadside bombings, these IED attacks, every single month in Iraq. And they were the leading cause of casualties among both American soldiers as well as Iraqi civilians. Now, the team that's hunting for this roadside bomb is called an EODT, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. They're the pointy end of the spear in the effort to stop these roadside bombings. If you've seen the movie Hurt Locker, that's about an EOD team. In a typical tour in Iraq, an EOD team will go out on 600 bomb calls. That is, they'll be asked to defuse about two bombs every single day. The number that's probably the better indicator, though, of the value of these EOD teams to the war effort is the fact that the insurgents put a reported $50,000 bounty on the head of an EOD soldier. Kill one of them, get $50,000. Unfortunately, this particular bomb call would not end well. By the time that EOD soldier got close enough to the device to see that it was a bomb, that it wasn't a piece of trash, they could see it by the, road, by the wires coming out from it, it was too late. The bomb exploded. Now, depending on how much explosive is packed into one of these devices, you have to be about a football field away to escape either death or injury from the fragments coming at you at bullet speed. In fact, even if you're not hit by one of the fragments, just the sheer force of the explosion itself break your limbs. The soldier, though, had been right on top of that roadside bomb. And so when the rest of their team advanced, they found little left of them. And that night, the commander of the unit did their sad job. They sat down and wrote a letter back to the U.S., wrote a condolence letter. And they apologized for not being able to bring that soldier home. They talked about how tough the loss had been on the rest of the team, how the rest of the team had felt like they'd lost their bravest comrade soldier that had gone out always on point time and time again on 18 different missions saved their lives but this is what the commander ended the letter with he went on to try and talk up the silver lining that he took away from the loss this is what he wrote quote at least when a robot dies you don't have to write a letter to its mother that is that soldier was a 42 pound robot called a pack bot 
the condolence letter didn't go to some farmhouse in Iowa, like always happens in the old war movies, but went to a company just outside Burlington, Massachusetts, that on the side of it says, I, Robot. It is a real world company named after the fictional Isaac Asimov novel and the not so great Will Smith movie, in which <laughs> robots start out by doing daily chores. iRobot is the same company that makes the Roomba. Robots start out by doing daily chores and move on to making life and death decisions. Now, I'm not one for PowerPoint, so what I'm gonna play for you here is actually not, um, not linked to here we go, good. Um, it's not linked to the speech, it's actually just background. It's both to give you a sense of the reality of the technologies that are either already active in war today or already at the prototype stage. Just to give you a sense of the science reality of war today. Another way of putting this is that you're not gonna see any science fiction here. They aren't powered by Vulcan technology. They don't depend on teenage wizard hormones. These are the real deal when we're talking about war. It, now, the book Wired for War is about how there's something big going on in war today. And maybe even the story of not just science, but humanity itself. The US military went into Iraq with a handful of drones, pilotless planes, unmanned aerial systems, UAVs. We went in with a handful. We now have over 7,000 in the US military inventory. On the ground, our invasion force went in with zero ground robotics. We now have over 12,000 in the U.S. military inventory. This year, the U.S. Air Force will train more drone pilots than it will manned fighter and manned bomber plane pilots combined. And we need to remember, these are just the first generation. When we talk about things like that Packbot or the Predator drone that people have heard of, we're really talking about the Model T4, the Wright Brothers flyer of what's out there. In the technology industry term, killer app, short for killer application, doesn't just describe what iPods have done to the music industry. It takes on a whole new meaning when you're talking about robots that are increasingly armed with everything from machine guns to hellfire missiles. Now, that's what's happening right now. Peering forward, one Air Force three-star general that I met with described how we won't be talking about conflicts as now involving thousands of robots, but very soon, quote, tens of thousands of robots. And they're not gonna be tens of thousands of these kind of robots here, because everything's moving forward. There'll be tens of thousands of tomorrow's robots and beyond. One of the things that a lot of you are probably familiar with is what they call Moore's Law. The idea that just about every two years, we've been able to pack more and more computing power into our microchips, so they double in their power. Moore's Law is the reason, for example, if um, how many people in this room have ever given or received one of those Hallmark greeting cards that opens up and plays a little song? Just raise your hand. That one greeting card that you had, had more computing power than the entire US Air Force did in 1960. That one card. That's because of Moore's Law, that doubling effect, multiplying year after year after year. If Moore's Law holds true the way it's held true for the last 40 years, then within 25 years, our technologies, our computers, our robots will be a billion times more powerful than today. And I don't mean a billion in kind of the amorphous way people toss around the term, you know, like in the movie Austin Powers, you know, one billion. I mean literally take the power of those systems and multiply them with a one and nine zeros behind it. That's what's gonna play out over the next 25 years if Moore's Law holds true. What if Moore's Law doesn't hold true the way it's held true for the last 40 years? What if it just goes a hundredth as fast? Well, then our systems will be just a mere million times more powerful than today. So what we have to think about here is that the kind of things that we only used to talk about at science fiction conventions need to be talked about by people like us, need to be talked about by people in the Pentagon. We are living through a robots revolution. Now, when I say robots revolution, I need to be very careful here. I'm not talking about the kind of revolution where you know, the governor of California is gonna show up at your door, all of the Terminator movies. It's not that kind of robots revolution. It's a very different kind. 
It's the idea that every so often in history, a technology comes along that rewrites the rules of the game. It forces us to ask new questions about not only what's possible that wasn't possible before, but what's proper that we didn't have to think about the right and wrong of before. These are very rare in history. These are things like the printing press, the computer, gunpowder, the atomic bomb. Now the thing that's interesting is when we have these revolutions in war, they've always affected the how of war. They've always been a technology that had either a dramatically bigger boom, like the atomic bomb and all the changes that that caused both in war and politics, or they had a dramatically faster firing rate like the machine gun and all the changes that that caused in war and politics. Or they were a technology that allowed you to shoot dramatically further, like gunpowder or the airplane, and all the changes that that caused in war and politics and beyond. That's playing out with robotics today, another change in the how of war. But it's the very first revolution that's also affecting the who of war. It's reshaping warrior's very experience, warrior's very identity. Another way of putting this is, humankind has had a 5,000-year-old monopoly on the fighting of wars. And that monopoly is broken down in our lifetime. Now, I thought that was a rather big deal, and I also thought it was rather strange that we really weren't talking about it. And so, a couple years ago, I set out to gather the stories of what it's like in this revolution. So, what it's like to be a scientist or engineer who builds these robots. What are the science fiction authors who are influencing them think about all of this. What's it like to be an Air Force drone pilot sitting in Nevada flying a plane that's actually over Afghanistan? What's it like for the four-star generals who command them? What do the politicians think about all of this? The other side of the coin, what do insurgents in the Middle East think about our robots? What do they think about us sending robots out to fight them? How about journalists? Not just journalists in the US, but journalists in places like Pakistan, India, Lebanon. How are they reporting on this and shaping public perceptions? And then finally, the right and wrong of all of this. So interviews with people at places like the International Red Cross and also Human Rights Watch. And so Wired for War is really about these stories, gathering them together. But more importantly, the ripple effects that this technology is having on our politics, our wars, our business, our society our laws. So what I'd really like to do is in the remaining time is flush a few of these ripple effects out for it because I think that's the interesting part of the story. Now the first one is what you're actually seeing play somewhat here is the fact that this revolution in robotics is not just an American revolution. There's a rule in both technology and war. There's no such thing as a permanent first mover advantage. So quick show of hands here. How many people in this room use Commodore computers? <laughs> How many of you play video games on your Atari? All right, we've got some real old school people back there. I'm a little dubious, but we'll see. But the point is, those companies were dominant players at the start, and they're not anymore. The same thing has held true in terms of not a permanent first mover advantage in war. The British, for example, were the ones who invented the tank. The Germans were the ones who figured out how to use the tank better. So one of the things we have to think about in terms of the United States is that we are very much ahead in this technology, this robotic technology today, particularly in its use in war, but we're not the only player in town. There's 43 other countries out there that are building, buying, and using military robots. And they're countries that range from Russia and China and Japan to Burkina Faso. And one of the things we have to question is where do the current trends have us headed in this revolution? Where does the state of American manufacturing industry have us headed? Where does the state of our science and mathematics and our schools have us headed in this revolution? Upwards or downwards? Or another way of putting it is, what does it mean to be sending out more and more soldiers whose hardware says made in China on the back of it, and soldiers whose software is increasingly written somewhere else, like in India? What does that mean for a nation state that depends on these? 
But just like the software industry has gone open source, the same thing is playing out in warfare. That is, it's not just the big boys who control the game. Like what happened in software, the same thing's playing out in warfare. It's not just the major states or even the small states that have ownership over all of this. We're also seeing non-state actors move in. Now, the examples range across. One of the groups that I talk about in the book is a group of college kids from Swarthmore up in Pennsylvania who wanted to do something about the genocide in Darfur. So they held a battle of the bands. They ended up fundraising about a half million dollars, whereupon these college kids entered into negotiation with a private military company for the rental of a set of drones to deploy to Sudan. College kids held the negotiations out of their dorm room. There's, of course, a darker side to this, used by groups that maybe don't want to do things like stop a genocide or do these talks out of their dorm rooms. For example, in the war between Israel and Hezbollah, Hezbollah may not be a nation state, may not be a formal military, but it was still able to fly four drones back at Israel. So what we have is this flattening effect coming to war and technology and those that can use it. And I think the trends lead two things to come out of this to keep our um, eyes on. One is it continues the empowerment of individuals and small groups against state governments. The balance of power is changing. The second is that it widens the playing field of those who might play at the game of terrorism. Another way of putting it is the next generation of Al-Qaeda 2.0, but also the next generation of a Timothy McVeigh or um, a Unabomber might be more lethal because guess what? They don't have to be suicidal. But the ripple effects of this go out into other areas, including our own politics. One of the people that I interviewed I thought put this really well was a former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Ronald Reagan. This is what he said, quote, I like these systems because they save lives, but I also worry about more marketization of war, more shock and awe talk to defray discussion of the costs. People are more likely to support the use of force if they view it as costless. And so what we have here is that there are certain trends that are already playing out in our politics in America today that robotics may take to their final logical ending point. The way to think about it is this. We don't have a draft anymore. We don't declare war anymore. We don't buy war bonds or pay higher taxes for our wars anymore. And now we have this technology that allows us to carry out acts of force without sending people into harm's way. And so the barriers to war in our democracy were already lowering, and now we have a technology that allows these barriers to hit the ground. Now, it may sound kind of theoretic what I'm talking about, but I think it's playing out right now. When you look at the raw numbers, We've actually carried out more robotic drone strikes into Pakistan over the last year than we did airstrikes with manned bombers into Kosovo and Serbia during the Kosovo War just a decade ago. But unlike the Kosovo War, we didn't have a debate about it in our Congress or the UN. The media doesn't report about it every single night. We just did it because we viewed it as costless to us. The irony in all of this, though, is that while the future of war may involve more and more machines, war is still about our human failings. And all the ripple effects that come out of it are about human psychology. So think about that in terms of viewing it as costless to us. Is that the same on the other side? We have a policy riddle right now to figure out that sounds like science fiction, but is real. What are robots' impact on the war of ideas that we're fighting against radical groups around the world. What is the message we think we are sending when we use robots in war versus what is the message that's actually being received? Again, I wanted to know this, so I went around interviewing people. And one of the people that I thought put it rather well in terms of our perception of what we thought was a senior um, Bush administration official. And he said, quote, our unmanning of war plays to our strength. The thing that scares people is our technology. Well, what about when you go speak with those people? What do they think? 
This is what the um, editor of the leading newspaper of Lebanon had to say. And he actually described this um, to me while there was a drone <laughs> flying above him right at that moment. He said, quote, it's just another sign of the cold-hearted, cruel Israelis and Americans who are also cowards because they send out machines to fight us. They don't want to fight us like real men, but they're afraid to fight, so we just have to kill a few of their soldiers to defeat them. We have an absolute disconnect between the message we think we are sending versus the message that's being received. Does it mean that either message is actually accurate? It's just a misperception on both sides. But there's another thing that's changing at a very large level. Think about the phrase, going to war. What does it mean to go to war? That phrase, to go to war, has meant the same thing for the last 5,000 years. Whether you were talking about the ancient Greeks going to war against Troy, or my grandfather going to war against the Japanese in the Pacific. To go to war at its most basic level meant to go to a place where there was such danger that you might never come home again. When you went to war, you accepted the risk that you might never see your family again. That's what going to war has meant for the last 5,000 years until today. This is what a um, Predator drone pilot described of what it was like to fight insurgents in Iraq while never leaving Nevada. Quote, you are going to war for 12 hours, shooting weapons at targets, directing kills on enemy combatants. And then you get in the car and you drive home. And within 20 minutes, you're sitting at the dinner table talking to your kids about their homework. This is an absolutely new experience of war, the ability to be at war and simultaneously at home. And it's causing all sorts of new things that we really don't understand yet. Like one of which is that they're finding that the levels of combat stress for the remote warriors in some situations are actually as high or higher than for those <laughs> units that are physically deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. There's another change that comes out of this, the ripple effects on the demographics of war. Who can do what in war? One of the neat stories in the book is about a 19-year-old um, high school dropout who joins the army to try and make his dad proud of him again. He wants to be a helicopter mechanic. It turns out that he's not qualified to be a helicopter mechanic under the army's rules because he failed his high school English class. So the army recruiter says, would you like to be a drone pilot instead? He turns out to be so good at it largely because of his video game skills, which is what I joke is probably why he failed the high school English class. But he turns out to be a natural, so to speak, that they actually, after his first deployment, bring him back, they promote him to the specialist, which for those of you who don't know um, the military, that is roughly the second lowest rank in the military. Went from the lowest rank to the second lowest rank. They promote him, and then they make him an instructor in the training academy. It's a really neat story from one perspective because through this technology, he found himself and made his dad proud of him and he's serving his nation. I was recently at the Air Force Academy. They did not like this story because you have a 19-year-old high school dropout who's not even an officer, who's in the Army. And not only is he an instructor, but he's actually taken out more targets than any F-15 pilot. This is a huge change when you think about who does what in war and who gets honored in war. But don't think about robotics as just things that are outside us. They're also playing out within us. So one of the other neat stories in the book is about the um, what could be a great tragedy. There are more American soldiers that are being wounded by these roadside bombs, these IEDs, but fortunately living because of advanced medical technology and body armor. But the difference is, is that that means that the rates of people who are losing their arms and legs in war are greater than before. There are over 400 American soldiers that have had their arms or legs blown off by these roadside bombs replaced with robotic arms and legs that have allowed them not just to go back to leading their lives, but actually to go back to their combat units with these robotic arms or legs. The head of the program describes it as the Luke Skywalker effect. For those of you who know your Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, 
Luke gets his hand cut off by Darth Vader. And we go, oh, no, our hero, you know, what's he going to do? And then fortunately, by the end of the movie, they give him a robot hand. And he can go on to, you know, Return of the Jedi. That was science fiction. For 400 American soldiers, that's science reality already. Now, much of what you're hearing here is that there's always two sides to every technology, every revolution. So while Moore's Law may be happening with this advancement year after year after year, it doesn't mean we've gotten rid of Murphy's Law. So you're getting these incredible science fiction-like capabilities, but that also means that you have incredible science fiction-like dilemmas that you have to figure out, that we have to figure out. And these are everything from mistakes that happen, either intentionally or unintentionally, or because of the fog of war. Now, people in robotics companies describe these as oops moments. That is, what happens when things don't work out with your robot? It's an oops moment. That's what the head of one robots company said. What are oops moments when we're talking about robots in war? Sometimes these oops moments are, you know, kind of funny. Like the first time they tested out a machine gun armed robot, it went, quote, swirly. It started spinning in a circle, and it pointed its gun at the review stand of VIPs who were there to watch. They were happy that there were no bullets in the gun at the time. Other times, these oops moments are tragic. Like last year in South Africa, an anti-aircraft cannon had a, quote, software glitch. During a training exercise, it was supposed to fire into the sky. Because of the software glitch, it lowered. It fired in a circle. It killed nine soldiers before it ran out of ammunition. It was the scene from RoboCop playing out in reality. These oops moments create new legal consequences and categories that we have to figure out. Like the idea of unmanned slaughter. What happens when you kill the wrong person? Such as the three times where we thought we got Osama bin Laden with a predator drone strike, and we were wrong. In one situation, it was an Afghan civilian who was just unlucky enough to look like bin Laden when viewed through the video camera of the predator. Now, these are situations that have already happened where we're still part of most of the decisions. But of course, as you well know, that's not always going to be the case. The technology is advancing and advancing, and we're giving them more and more autonomy. Now, this raises some fascinating questions for things like war crimes. Are they going to be more or less likely with robots in war? And on one hand, you can say they'll be less likely, because many war crimes happen out of emotion. They're crimes of rage or revenge. Your buddy gets killed, and they lash out against local civilians. Robots are emotionless, so they won't commit those crimes, crimes of rage. But robots are emotionless. They don't have a sense of empathy, a sense of guilt, a sense of honor. A robot looks at an 80-year-old grandmother in her wheelchair the exact same way it looks at a T-80 tank. They're both just <coughs> zeros and ones in the programming language. So that sets this really interesting challenge before us, which is how do we catch up our 20th century laws of war? The laws of war actually are so old right now that if they were people, they would qualify for Medicare. How do we catch them up to 21st century technologies like the ones that you've seen here. And more importantly, how do you catch them up in turn when these 21st century technologies are being used against 21st century adversaries who are trying to take advantage of these laws of war? So you have a pilot sitting in Nevada flying a Reaper drone that's targeting an insurgent who's using an ambulance to move ammunition back and forth. The laws of war are under challenge from both sides. And this leads up to maybe the most important aspect that I think is appropriate for this room, which is the ethics of all of this. Now, typically when people talk about robots and ethics, they say, oh, you mean Asimov's three laws, of course. And there's a couple problems with that. The first is Asimov's laws are fiction. How do you program English in the software? The second is Asimov made them as plot devices. In every one of his stories, the robots figure out how to break the laws, or they don't play out into their intentions. As the, the poster for the movie put it, for iRobot the movie, was that rules were made to be broken. 
But the third is the most important. Asimov's laws don't apply to the current reality. That is, we don't want to build robots that have a sense of self-preservation. The whole point of them is so that you don't have to send the soldier into danger. We don't want to build robots that will take orders from any old human. I don't want a robot that walks up to Osama bin Laden and bin Laden can say, robot, turn off. Robot, reprogram yourself and turn around. And most importantly, that ultimate of Asimov's laws that robots shall not harm human, well, that kind of defeats the purpose if you're arming them with Hellfire missiles and 50 caliber machine guns. That's the whole point. So Asimov's laws really don't apply in the real world. But the most important thing of this is that it's not the ethics, and I use that loosely when we're talking about a machine. Can a machine have ethics? That's not the real important part of it that we need to talk about. It's the ethics of the people behind the machine that I think really matters. For example, what should we build? What shouldn't we build when it comes to robots and war? What attributes should they have? What should they not? Who should be allowed to buy these robots? Who should be allowed to use them? Who shouldn't be allowed to use them? And most importantly in all of this is the idea that ethics, without any sense of accountability, is empty. It's meaningless. Now, somewhat controversially, uh, I guess, um, in the book, I argued that we should think about the responsibilities all the way across the causal chain. That is, it's not just the end user of the robot, the soldier in the field, that we should think about their ethics and holding them accountable if things go wrong. That we should think about this across the entire chain of causality. Another way of putting it is, Dr. Frankenstein shouldn't get a free pass just because he has a PhD. Now, the challenge in all of this is that we really aren't having these kind of conversations about ethics in the field of robotics today. A young roboticist has no code to turn to the way someone working in, for example, medicine has to turn to. The field isn't trying to generate a broader discussion about its social impact the way, for example, other cutting edge fields like genetics are doing. And most importantly, we really don't want to think about the links between what people are working on and inventing in places like here or elsewhere, and what plays out in the battlefield. And it's interesting because um, for those of you who've read the book, you'll know that I have a real strong sense of respect for those who are proud of their work. Those who are proud that they're building these robots to go out into war and save lives, soldiers' lives. Or those who say, you know what, I don't want my work to be used in war. And they're refusing to take for example, Pentagon money. They describe it as the refusings. I'm very, I, I have a lot of respect for them. The problem is that they are in a minority. There's this vast group in the middle that wants to, for example, take military money for their research, but act as if they have nothing to do with war. And maybe most disappointing to me was um, an email that I received after a talk like this where um, it was actually at a, 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 it was at a competitor, so it was at Carnegie Mellon. And a professor emailed me afterwards and said he was very upset with me because I, quote, troubled his students by asking them to think about the ethics of their work. <laughs> I'm sorry if this troubles anyone. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying think about what you do and be proud of what you do. So I'm going to end here because I really want to more engage with all of you and just say this. It's two things. One, this all sounds like science fiction, but as you saw from all of those pictures, this is already science reality. Every single example that I gave you, except that very last one about the um, grandmother and the T-80 tank, every other example was not from the future of war, it was from the past of war. The second thing is this, and I actually do want to jump into sci-fi. Um, a couple years ago, the AFI, the American Film Institute, did a study, gathered a group, and said, let's name the top 100 Hollywood heroes and top 100 Hollywood villains of all time. What characters out of every single Hollywood movie ever made represent the best of humanity, and what characters represent the worst of humanity? 
only one character out of every single movie ever made was on both the top 100 hero and top 100 villain list. Who do you think it was? Terminator, a robot killing machine. And I think this shows a couple of things. The first is it shows the duality of the technology itself. It can be used both for good and for evil. But it also shows the duality of the people behind the machines. Because when we think about it, there's one thing that really distinguishes us as a species. It's our creativity. Our creativity is what allowed us to build fire. It's what allowed us to build architecture like this. It's what allowed us, our species alone, to go to the moon. And now we're using this creativity to build these incredible technologies. And if you believe both the scientists, but also the science fiction authors, we may be creating an entirely new species, perhaps in our image. But if we're honest about it, the thing that's driving us to create it is actually the fact that we can't get past what seems to be an age-old human need to destroy one another. So the end question this is this. Is it our machines, or is it us who's wired for war? Thank you. You can uh, just raise your hand and, and, and introduce yourself and where you're from. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear your questions or comments. Fire away. Okay, thanks, sir. Uh, I just wonder, uh, what is your When people think about artificial intelligence, they have a <coughs> images. Um, you know, it's like Hal from the 2001 movies, or it, it has to have the full consciousness and thought of a human. And there's lots of debates among you know the scientists on when this is going to happen or if it will happen. Um, and you know it's it's very interesting to me as a as a analysts coming in and they'll get these fierce arguments. Oh, it's going to happen in, you know, 2032. No, 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 no. It'll be 2038 because it'll be delayed. No, no, no. It's going to speed up faster. 2020. That to me is almost beside the point is the fact that well before you get to, you know, Skynet level or anything like that, if it ever happens, we already have technology that is doing the things that humans used to do. So, for example, you use the example um, target recognition, identifying an enemy and saying they are an enemy. Um, I saw a uh, visit in an Air Force lab. Uh, it was a multi they, they call this multi-spectrum analysis. It is a sensor system that combines everything from a high-powered camera, so they can see better than any human eye with radar, ground penetrating radar, infrared, chemical analysis, et cetera. So um, for those of you who uh, might be familiar with like the, the Predator movies, the ability to switch between seeing visually to seeing infrared to seeing chemical makeup. So I'm looking at that person right there, and I see him visually, but then I can see his skeletal, and then I can see, hold it, under his shirt he has a gun because I'm doing it by the metal detection, et cetera. And they found that this system um, is uh, roughly 98% accurate. The human eye is somewhere around 60% accurate. So much, much better. Now, the flip side of all this is that there's still some things that we can't naturally do within AI. And I use the example of the sword system, which was that um, machine gun arm robot. It has incredible accuracy. It's able to turn a 50 caliber machine gun to a sniper rifle. So it can hit, using this machine gun, a apple from about 800 meters away, something no human could do with a machine gun. It doesn't have the ability naturally to tell the difference between an apple and a tomato, which any two-year-old knows without thinking about it. And so these are some of the challenges that come out of this. But the real issue is this, is, is not this you know, ability to recognize. It's that fuzzy line 
It's the shopkeeper who may be an insurgent at night, but is a shopkeeper during the day. So no matter how artificially intelligent or human intelligent that system is, in modern war, these questions are really difficult. And so when people think, all right, if I just apply enough science to this, I'll solve it, I'll be able to match human capacity, well, guess what? We can't figure these things out right now. They're really difficult. And so we shouldn't expect technology to be sort of the silver bullet solution. Way up there in the, the top. If you need to introduce yourself to uh, name's Brian from Stevens here. Uh, <laughs> grew up in Stevens, okay. <laughs> um, now, a question of uh, to Moral, though. Like, often in the past, if something's like, for instance, sniper warfare during the Vietnam War, it was highly effective it, and it was used a lot, but there was an initial opposition towards it where a few people had to fight in order to actually keep using it. Um, with this, but what ended up moral story is the rules of morale, the moral rules got rewritten around that. Do you think that something similar was going to end up happening to this? It's, it's a great question. I would actually go back further than Vietnam is um, the example that really illustrates it well. Uh, and I talk about this in the book. There's a letter from this nobleman in um, Middle Ages Europe, in the, around the 1400s, who writes someone and says, Anyone who uses gunpowder in battle is a coward. To use guns is not an act of war, it's an act of murder. So we used to think using guns was something that only cowards would do. And of course, we caught up our conceptions of what was brave or cowardly and said, you know what, using guns isn't anymore. And I think sort of the same thing is one of these aspects that's playing out with these technologies where some people, um, have different interpretations of whether they're ethical or not, legal or not, and we're gonna have a debate over it, but one of the drivers for all the things that people in, you know, for example, human rights groups wanna to push towards, there's also the fact, as you raised, that they're really effective, and that is part of it. Now, the interesting thing to me is not just where does this debate end up, what do we decide is legal or not, but first is when do we decide that? So for example, landmines were something that we waited about 90 years after they were invented, and about after 40 million of them were put under the earth, to then decide, you know what, we don't think these are legal. It was, it was too late. The other is that the dispute over what's legal or ethical to use actually has big political consequences. We're seeing that today in Pakistan, where because of these drone strikes, which we think are rightful, and we say, you know what, there are a lot less civilian casualties because of these drone strikes than if we'd done them with regular technologies, and they're true. But the flip side is, it's made the US, as a leading Pakistani newspaper described, enemy number one in public perception there. But there's even historic examples of this. Um, another science fiction-like technology was the submarine. The submarine, you know, Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, um, there was another short story written by Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes stories. And he wrote this short story in 1914, before World War I started, about how submarines might be used in a blockade of Great Britain. The British Navy, the Admiralty, went public to mock Arthur Conan Doyle, saying, this is an absurd idea that people would use submarines to attack civilian shipping. No Navy would ever do something like that. And in fact, if any captain ever used his submarine to attack civilian shipping, his own Navy would line him up against the wall and shoot him. Six months later, World War I begins, and the Germans decide, you know what, we are going to use submarines that way. The interesting thing, though, is that it was the dispute over whether using submarines, which were the science fiction technology just a couple years earlier, to use them that way is actually what drew America into World War I. We thought using them that way was illegal, that the Germans were committing a version of a war crime. And so that's what drew America into World War I, which is actually what helped America become a superpower, all out of this dispute over the right and wrong of it. So the, the long, long story short, these disputes really do matter in the way, not just what happens in war, but the way they change our world.
Yeah. Great question. It's almost, um, will we even view it as war anymore? Um, I, this is the, the real answer is I don't see us moving towards that anytime soon. Um, what we're rather seeing is mixtures of humans and using more and more robotics in war. Um, the U.S. military's plan is almost like um, you could imagine the way a football team works where the human would be the quarterback calling the plays and the unmanned systems, be they on the ground or in the air, are like the wide receivers that carry out the play. But in football, the wide receiver, even though there's a play, if they see something changing, they can break off from the play and, and react. And that's much of what we'll see playing out with these unmanned systems. But the interesting thing, again, um, to me, you know, so you've got that mixture there. really. To me, though, it's again these ripple effects, not just how we use them in war, but the ripple effects beyond it of doing things. So, you know, one of the things I talked about, if we're doing it more and more that way, using more and more of these systems, does it mean we go to war more and more often? Or another th thing to think about this, um, one of the things I talk about in the book is the rise of YouTube war. What's YouTube war? Well, these machines are very different than anything else in history, and then it's not just that you don't have a human inside them, but they're recording everything that they see. So if they're recording everything that they see, it allows an interface with the public to war that didn't exist before. That is, we already have over 3,000 video clips of combat footage from Iraq and Afghanistan up online right now, up on sites like youtube.com. Now we can say that's a really good thing, the public has the ability to watch for itself what's happening in battle, something it could never do before. And it doesn't have to rely on the mainstream media for finding out what's happening in Iraq or Afghanistan. But we need to remember, when we're talking about these technologies, they're still playing out in our very real, very human, sometimes very weird world. And so for some people, the ability to download a video clip of combat footage from Iraq onto their iPhone isn't something for information, it's something for entertainment. And the soldiers have a name for it. They call it war porn, war pornography. Um, a typical example that I got was an email, and the title line of the email said, watch this. You know, we all get emails like that that have that, and they have a link to a video, and that video may be, you know, some really cool dunk in an NBA game or you know some nerdy fat kid dancing in his basement something like that that's the watch this well in this case the watch this was a predator drone strike hellfire missile drops comes into the target explosion bodies tossed into the air it was set to music it was a music video it was set to the song I just want to fly by the band Sugar Ray so we have this ability, and it's one of these things from using more and more of this, we have the ability to watch more but experience less when it comes to war. And it has kind of a warping effect as well because when you're watching these clips, you may think you understand what's happening in war now more, but you don't because again, you're just the viewer, you're the spectator, you're watching it from afar. Yeah. Uh, Mike Wolf from uh, Rivers, New Jersey. Um, you sort of just had a question. What do you think is going to happen once it's, uh, our enemies get uh, like the robot uh, stuff as well as robot versus robot, and then they start being used on like American, like they send them to like uh, American soil or something like that? What do you think is going to uh, happen? Then? There's a couple of things. I mean, another part of this I think will be <laughs> fascinating is it opens up new domains of conflict, um, what we can call wars of persuasion. So think about it this way. If you're a pilot of an of a F-15, I can't hack into your brain and say, pilot, reprogram all other F-15s as 
MIGs and shoot them down. With computerized systems, we have that possibility. And as probably most of you know, Pierre, um, pretty much anything that's computerized can be hacked. And so this opens up an entire new domain of conflict that we have to think about. Um, and the high tech side of things also will see its parallel on the low tech side. So we're already seeing uh, jamming of our robotic systems by insurgent groups in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we're already seeing them attempt to build their own. Actually, have built a couple of their own. But also, again, the thing here is don't forget that while we're talking about technology, war is still messy. So um, what's one of the most lethal systems against a machine gun armed ground robot? A six-year-old with a can of spray paint. So think about it this way. That six-year-old can walk up to your system and they've just blinded your system. They've just defeated it. And you have a dilemma that you have to figure out. Do you either shoot that six-year-old, who all they are, they're armed with a can of spray paint, or do you let them defeat you? These are the kind of challenges people are wrestling with in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, now, I actually used this example uh, when I was meeting with a group from our Joint Forces Command. Um, and one of the officers yelled out, well, we'll just load a um, non-lethal weapon system on it and we'll tase that little six-year-old. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a response. Um, what I pushed back to him was this, was yes, that's true, you know, but um, how much will it cost for that upgrade Couple hundred, to a couple hundred thousand to a million, versus the investment that the other side made in the forty cent can of spray paint. So for every forty cent upgrade they're doing, we're spending another million plus. And then we have a viral video going around of some little <laughs> six-year-old being tased by an American robot. You know, we saw how the taser video went around from that college campus a couple years ago. You know, don't tase me, dude. Well, now we've got one of a of a kid. So the point here is this is that whenever we're talking about technology, put it in a social context and then think of the most challenging thing that can happen. And that's what will play out in war and society. And the same thing you asked about within the US. Incredible capabilities for um, protecting the homeland against terrorism. Uh, you know, we have this very strange odd phenomena where we're really only protecting our airports and we're only protecting them with some of the least trained, worst paid people in our entire economy. Versus you can have a computerized system that doesn't get bored, doesn't nod off, isn't playing on their cell phone when they're supposed to be scanning. On the other hand, do I want to live in a US where all of my movements are watched by a system and it's the one deciding who is a target for further investigation or not. It isn't a theoretic thing anymore. Um, when I said, you know, one of the questions of who should be allowed to operate these systems, the Predator drone. Is the Predator drone a military-only technology? Homeland Security already has six of them. LA Police Department's exploring purchasing its own drones. Do I have the right to buy one? Why not? It's my Second Amendment right. It's all theoretic, but it's actually not. Yeah, wait, back up there in the top corner. Uh, Andrew, I'll slide teach history here in um, upstate New York. Um, the, the business side of it is interesting to me, um, and it's only a little bit tongue in cheek uh, when I uh, suggest this scenario. So Tom Friedman thinks, or we all agree that we need to innovate our way out of a recession. Tom Friedman thinks uh, it should be green technology. Uh, it sounds like there's big uh, margins in this. Uh, there's a lot of government grants going into it. Uh, you can sell it to, to maybe anybody. Um, is that going to drive this more than our ethical discussion? It's, it's a um, great question, and it's one of the things. Some people argue that because of all the dangers of this, we should do something that we, we didn't do with like research into atomic power and the atomic bomb. That if you remember back to the atomic bomb, there were these scientists who were so excited about working on the cutting edge 
they invent the atomic bomb, and then after the fact, they go, my gosh, what did I do? I shouldn't have done that. And actually, they have this odd phenomena where the inventors of the atomic bomb were the same people who founded the international arms control movement to end the atomic bomb, the very same people. And so there's a set of um, scientists who are pushing for this, you know, saying, don't make that same mistake. And we should do what we call relinquishment. Just say, what well, you know what, we're not going to invent anymore. There's a couple problems with that that I talk about in the book. The first is, um, as, uh, is basically human nature. We're curious and creative. Second is the way science works. And actually, Einstein put it really well. He said, if we knew what would happen, we wouldn't call it science. It's kind of a cool and scary quote when you think about it. But then the final part is um, these things are really useful. They're really useful in war. There are literally hundreds of soldiers alive today because of them. And as you asked, they're very profitable. And this is a potential booming industry. In fact, um, Bill Gates uh, said that he sees robotics as being where computers were back in 1980. And that if he was a young man just entering the field today, he would go into robotics rather than computers. Now, what's interesting about that, again to me, is these ripple effects. So think back to the computer in 1980. It's this big, bulky device, doesn't do very much. The military is the main spender on research and development. It's the main buyer of computers. And then, and this is what Gates sees happening, is that you prove more and more applications of computers and soon you get to the point where we stop calling them computers anymore. So I have 100 computers in my car. I don't call it a computer car. I have a computer in my kitchen. I call it a microwave oven. And he sees the same thing playing out with robotics. And actually, we are starting to see that. So for instance, the um, new Mercedes-Benz has crash avoidance technology which is the very kind way of saying the robot car takes over if the stupid human doesn't look in their blind spot. We don't call it a robot car, but it has that. The Lexus parallel parks itself, because we humans have a major problem, parallel parking. And same things in war, but again, that's not where it stops. No one back in 1980 says, aha, this thing called the computer is going to allow me to social network my way into friendship with someone in China that I've never met before. But also, it's going to allow someone in Madrid to social network their way to being friends with my 10-year-old sister that I really don't want them to. So both a positive and a negative. And so what are going to be those ripple effects that come out of robotics? Yeah, right there. Um, my name is Nick Tanya from Auburn, New York. Uh, tagging on the economic point of this, I mean, I see things like the uh, Japanese robots conducting orchestras, all the way to like your check your check out at uh, Home Depot. Do you think it's like we're creating more jobs or destroying jobs? Like, what do you think? This is your opinion on that. Uh, interesting question. Um, so, some people believe that. Um, this is a way, as sort of to connects to the last one, that if we are able to build up a robotics industry, um, we'll be able to turn around certain uh, depressed parts of um, the economy and sort of innovate their way to success. And this is, for example, the strategy up there around the area of Pittsburgh. You know, this was, was where the center of the American steel industry was, and it's kind of hollow right now. And that's part of the thinking behind the expansion around Carnegie Mellon is you can turn this into almost like a capital of robotics. And it's definitely, you've got a lot of interesting things going on there. The flip side is that whenever there's a new technology, as you ask, it often, you know, there's winners and losers. People are replaced. So, um, and, and it'll, it'll be very interesting because it won't just be blue collar jobs. Um, think about, uh, what would be an example? Oh, a calculator. A calculator used to be one of the most highly paid occupations. It was a person who could do large number calculations in their head. They could do a lot of long division in their head. 
we don't value people who can do long division in their head anymore because we have calculators that can do it. Now, what's interesting about these winners and losers, and sorry, I'll give you a, a robot example of this. One of the people I interviewed was a um, scientist, and I kind of asked him the same question you did, and he, he said, look, I'll be replaced by robots before my barber will be replaced. And he was actually serious because he sees his designs evolving to being able to design other robots. We've already seen robots carrying out scientific experiments like um, in the issue of Nature Magazine, two issues back. But he doesn't see, so he sees himself being replaced even though he has a Stanford PhD. He doesn't see the barber being replaced. And the reason is, if you think about it, being a barber isn't just about having the ability to cut with precision. A machine can already do that. It's about having also a sense of aesthetics, a sense of style, knowing what's a cool haircut or not. A barber has to be able to talk with you about everything from the weather to who should have won American Idol. And you have to believe they mean it. And then finally, it's trust. You have to trust this person or this machine with a really sharp object right near your jugular. So what goes into who's replaced and who's not won't just be about who's at the top of the chain, who has the most um, university trained or not. It's going to be in very odd different areas. Um, now, to the, this connects to the question about terrorism. Because one of the people that I interviewed was um, Richard Clark, a very controversial guy. Um, Richard Clark, for those of you who haven't heard of him, was uh, a U.S. counterterrorism official, actually he was in charge of counterterrorism for the U.S. government, both, he, he worked for Bush Sr., Clinton, and Bush Jr. He was the fellow in the White House who, in spring 2001, famously sent a memo to Condi Rice that said, there's this group called Al-Qaeda, and you're not paying attention to them enough. And they wrote back and said, you're, you're exaggerating. 9-11 happens, and so what happens to Richard Clark, who had warned about the threat from Al-Qaeda? He got fired. Um, Richard Clark, who previously was right and no one listened, for the interview talked about his worry about the next change in terrorism, which is not just groups using these technologies, but the fact of whenever you have a new technology coming in, you have both winners and losers, and sometimes the losers aren't happy about it. And he called this the rise of the Neo-Luddites. The original Luddites were people back in the 1700s who were put out of work by the very first factories. And so a small percentage of them would hold riots and go in and try and burn down the factories. He sees a similar trend playing out and points to, for example, the Unabomber as the first of these. The Unabomber was a guy who said we're turning too much over to technology and so he started sending letter bombs to people who worked on computers. And um, it's, it, you know, this is a potential driver not just because people being put out of work, but also when there are debates in our society about big ethical issues, most importantly about what it means to be human or not, there's always a small minority that for some reason or another turns to violence. Think about the abortion debate. That's about what it means to be human or not at its basic level. And a very small minority started shooting at doctors and blowing up clinics. Not everyone that was opposed to it, but a small minority. And Clark's worry, Clark's prediction, is that because of these winners and losers, but also just people who are upset about it, that we may see conflicts actually sparked by this technology. That should probably be the last one. Well, that's a dour one to end on. <laughs> you can take one. Let's do one more. Any more questions? Yeah, right there. Uh, my name is David. I'm from South Jersey, New I just want to know what it's like to be Ron Stewart. Sorry, what was that? Did, did he, were you on um, a Ron Stewart? John Stewart. John Stewart. John Stewart. John Stewart. Uh, I was wondering who Ron was. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's a fun show. He's, the neat thing about him, um, he's, it seems to be exactly the same guy off screen that he is on screen. And, but that makes it really intimidating because he's just whip smart and you just don't know 
where he's going to go to next. And so sort of people will say, well, did, did you know what he was going to ask? And actually what played out is that um, when you do these interviews on TV, the hosts have a producer, someone separate, who will call you beforehand. And I spent about 45 minutes talking with the producer where she was asking questions, you know, what are questions he can ask that will lead to really interesting stories? Because we want it to be an interesting interview. So I thought I knew what he was going to ask. 45 minutes of waste because he didn't ask a single question that related to it because he, you know, he's smart enough to go in his own direction. So, I watched that episode. Yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, it's a fun show. And um, the, the strange thing for people in my field, and it maybe connects to um, what the professor here is looking at more broadly, is we have a comedy show that is actually where most of the serious discussions take place and the only one left with any credibility. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, think about it. Raise your hand right now. How many people in this room um, watch the evening news? How many in the people people in this room watch the John Stewart show? <laughs> so that's a, that is a I don't know what that means, but that's a big change. So um, I'll end on that. Thank you all for coming.